and when the British excavated them, they're, they're arranged in, a, in like a pattern. So if you can imagine, um, there's, like, there's like one central main stupa, and then next to that is two smaller stupas, and then next to them are a, a lot of other smaller stupas again. So the big stupa, of course, is the Buddha stupa. Now, when the British excavated there, they dug down in there and tried to find the Buddha's relics in there because they're sure there must have been Buddha's relics in there, but they couldn't find them. So the, so the relics are still in that stupa. Uh, and then the two smaller ones on the side, uh, they dug in there and actually found the caskets labelled with the names Sariputra and Moggallana. And uh, so these are very, very authentic relics. And uh, so, you know, it's arranged like the kind of circle of disciples. And then the outer ones, again, the smaller ones, were, were later monks, who were like local monks from that area. And so this is very, very historically important because this, this is the first time where we actually have the names and places and dates of particular individual monks who were living uh, a few hundred years after the Buddha. And historically this was very important because by one of these bizarre coincidences, the names recorded there are actually the same names as monks recorded in the Sri Lankan chronicles Sri Lankan histories and it has the same list of names sent as teachers to the same region. They were sent to the Himalayan region as teachers and on the casket it says these were the teachers of the Himalayan region and with the same group of names, not just one or two, there's five of them, the five, five monks with the same names. And so this was one of the key facts that actually tied the Sri Lankan chronicles into history and, and proved that there is a very solid uh, historical foundation to that. Uh, so these relics, were, especially the Sariputra Moggallana ones, caused a real sensation in the, in the Buddhist world around the time of the Buddha Jayanti in 1956. And uh, they were taken, as I said, all around. I'm not sure exactly where, but I think certainly Singapore, I think Hong Kong, maybe Japan, and all of these countries they were taken around. And of course, Sri Lanka as well. According to the traditional version. And then he would only accept, and he said, okay, Mahabhajapati has to take these eight what they call Garudamas. And uh, as we, we were talking, one of the things we discussed in Bodh Gaya, and everyone, these Garudamas is, is, have been badly mistranslated by almost all Western translators who call them like, because Garu literally means heavy. And so they're translated as being like the strict rules or the severe rules or something like that. Actually, it's a complete load of rubbish. The word Garu in Vinaya context always means respect. And so they're rules to be respected, that's all. Uh, it's nothing to do with being strict or heavy rules or anything like that. Now, one of these Garudamas is one that says a bhikkhuni, even ordained for a hundred years, has to bow down to a monk even if they're ordained that very day. And so, for some strange, women, strange reason, some women today, you know, these radical feminist types, find there's something wrong with that. I don't know why. The monks don't seem to have a problem with it. You know? And uh, so... So, so this is eight Garudamas. The first thing to notice about the Garudamas, of course, is most of them are actually very reasonable and actually quite nice um, and quite essential. And there's no real problem with it. Um, but there are a few rules like that one which obviously are quite problematic. So there are many, many complicated issues around these. First, The first thing that you just notice is that Straight out, it's impossible, absolutely impossible, that those Garudamas could have been laid down in the way described in the, in the Vinaya text as we have it today. It's, this is completely impossible. Uh, and this is very obvious from, a, from a, a very simple reading of the text that they refer to, proceed, the Garudamas themselves refer to events and procedures which didn't exist at the time when they were supposed to have been laid down. So, for example, they talk about, the Garudamas say that a bhikkhuni has to uh, do two years of training as a sikamana before she takes bhikkhuni ordination. Okay? Uh, but that, the institution of doing those two years of training is then gradually introduced later on in the vinaya, and the nuns didn't do it, obviously, and then you had problems. Women were ordained who were pregnant. Okay? And so then this training period was introduced later on. Okay? So it was obvious that it wasn't laid down at the start of the, the, the order like this. So we know that on a textual basis that that didn't happen. What actually happened, of course, is much harder to figure out. Uh, so um, many people, so myself and, and many others, have come to the conclusion that these things were not 
uh, part of the original vinaya, but were later interpolation. And uh, one of my books, maybe the next one or something, will be about that. So you can read all the gory details, if you like. But uh, <coughs> on a practical level, of course, textual criticism is one thing, but uh, persuading people to actually bother reading intelligent books about textual analysis is another thing. And so these things don't actually necessarily have a great deal of impact. Uh, practically speaking, I think that it's best to just not worry about these kinds of things too much. The important thing is that you actually have bhikkhunis, that they have training, that they have a place to stay, a place to practice, and all of these kinds of things. Now, what they do in the future, as far as bowing to monks or not bowing to monks, is up to them. And if they don't want to keep that rule, don't keep it. Monk, there's plenty of rules that monks don't want to keep. If you want me to sit here and list all the, all the rules in the vineyard that monks don't keep... You know, I can, starting, with, starting with one rule, which is that monks shouldn't have nuns wash their robes for them. Okay, now you go to Thailand and find me a monastery where the, where the monks aren't getting the Mechis to wash their robes for them. Yeah? So monks seem to be, find it quite apt to bend the rules and interpret them to, to fit them when it suits them. Uh, but these, these other rules are not, uh, so somehow seem to be sort of ironclad. So, you know. In, in uh, countries that have bhikkhunis, like, say, Korea and Taiwan and so on, the bhikkhunis will practice these in different ways. So some of them will keep the rules literally, uh, some of them will uh, not keep them and so on, and it really just depends. Personally, I think it's quite inappropriate to keep these things, especially in a, in a Western environment, um, but many of the, the nuns that I know, bhikkhunis that I know, uh, are quite adamant that they, they should be practiced. So... Uh, you know, I don't see it's my position to tell anybody that they should or should not keep these rules. But it's important to remember that this is just etiquette. You know, so fair enough. It has, it is important. It has an impact. You know, it it has an impact on the mind. It has an impact on perception, how people relate to each other, how they see themselves, how they're seen. So I'm not saying that it's not important, but its importance is within that context. It's etiquette. That's all, right? It's not. You know. <laughs> It's not anything more than that. And it's an attempt to uh, derive an etiquette which was perhaps considered appropriate by some people at some time and to then apply it in a very different time in a very different culture. Yeah? And also to remember that it's probably always been like this. And this is one, one thing that we forget is that rules, lists, rules don't tell you what people do, actually. Rules tell you what people don't do. Because if they're actually doing it, then there's no point in making a rule, right? If everyone's driving at 60 kilometers an hour, you don't need to make a rule about it. You only make a, a, a speed limit on the roads because people are speeding, right? So the very fact that that rule was felt necessary tells you that it wasn't followed and that, that, that some monks at some point in time wanted it to be followed because they're the ones who put the vineyard together, yeah? And uh, there's always another stream and this is, even within the Buddhist tradition, the ancient Buddhist tradition, this stream is still there. And there's interesting, there's another version of the origin story for bhikkhunis, which is just being edited now. It's in Turkish. And uh, it hasn't even been properly edited and come out, but it's one of these ancient manuscripts in old Turkish from the, um, what is now Iran. And in that version of events, it's not the whole Mahapajapati going there and being refused by the Buddha and things story at all. This is a different version. In this version of events, the Lichavis had made a rule forbidding women from going to the monastery. So it's the state forbidding the rule. And all the, the women got together and they said, we're not going to keep this. And they went to go to the monastery. And then the Lichavis came and stopped them in the Vesali area, and said, hey, what are you guys going? They said, we're going to visit the monastery. We want to become nuns. And they said, you can't do that. The Buddha spoke of the five uh, problems or dangers with women, right? the five flaws of women. And uh, they said, oh, we don't care about that. We're going anyway. So they went anyway. And they got to the Buddha, and he, he spoke about the five good things of women. Yeah? So it's, the, he's, it's, 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 it's said that, that he said the five problems with women, but what he actually said was the five advantages of women, yeah? and so then he gave the ordination. 
So this is what this shows you is that there was a dialogue, you know, there was this thing even within the Buddhist community. And given that it's been mostly the monks who've been controlling the texts, then the fact that uh, the texts seem to favour that point of view is hardly surprising.